Hey friends, on Plain Spoken, I'm delighted to have a format where I can talk to people who are much more intelligent and in the know than I am. Um, and I've dealt with people who are in the academy, people who've been in the church, uh, lay and clergy today. I'm really glad to be joined by a layman named Lonnie Brooks. He's been serving in the United Methodist Church for a long time. He first came on my radar at the beginning of this year whenever he published an op-ed that I, I thought was very insightful, and I'm going to ask him about that. But he has a career going back in the denomination where he he's uh, on the general conference level, very knowledgeable about the legislation that has been passed, the conversations that have been taking place for some time. He's, um, I've, I've talked with centrists who, who claim him as one of their own proudly. And so uh, everybody knows that I lean pretty far right. And so Lonnie, I, I asked him, I, I said, hey, no worries if you're, you're not excited to come on Plain Spoken. He said, no, I think, I think it'd be just fine. So he's been very gracious to set aside this time. He's in Anchorage, Alaska. It's early in the day for him, but um, he's, he's decided that he'll, he'll bear with me for a little bit as I ask him questions about the history of the United Methodist Church and his role in it and his prayers as they're coming up on general conference next year. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and bring you on screen. Lonnie, how are you doing this morning? I'm well, thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's really good to be here and uh, uh, be with you for this, uh, for this chat. Yeah, yeah. Usually, you know, I can never predict how many people are going to listen to different things that I do. Sometimes it's eight or 900. Sometimes it's three or 4,000. I have, I have no idea which of your friends are internet savvy and will like watching and listening to you. But I know that that I'm excited to hear from you this morning because uh, I've just gone down your Facebook uh, since reading your op-ed, and you regularly have insightful, nuanced takes on the United Methodist Church and decisions made in different corners. I'm wondering, um, I, I wasn't able to find a bio of you. I probably should have asked for one. But for my viewers, um, I, I'm just curious to know how far back your your time in the United Methodist Church goes, what it is you love about the United Methodist tradition, um, what what things factor into who you are that connect you to the United Methodist Church. I was born into a family that was uh, United Methodist, and uh, their roots went back into the United Methodist uh, uh, its predecessor uh, denomination, the Methodist Church, a long way. Um, in fact, the United the 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 Methodist Church uh, was born uh, only a year before I was in 1939. Of course, with the merger of the uh, three churches that had split apart in the lead up to the Civil War, uh, and uh, so I was born in 1940, uh, and. Uh, on September 5th, in fact, uh, and, um, uh, uh, happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had no three. idea. I would have asked you for another day, but happy birthday. Thank you for spending time with me. It's, it's going to be a busy day, but, um, yeah, that's the way a birthday should be. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh so in fact, my earliest memory that, that I have of anything was in, uh, uh, when my mother carried me into the, uh, nursery at First Methodist Church in Orlando, Florida, where uh, I was growing up, uh, and put me down on the floor, and I'm I'm crawling into the the room, uh, eager to play with the blocks and other stuff that they had in there, of course, in nursery, and, and so I cherish that memory and keep it alive by rehearsing it from time to time. Uh, but uh, from there, I, it just grew. I I uh, grew into uh, being an active youth and uh, young adult in that church there in Orlando. Uh, and it followed me. In fact, that it was participating in that church that inspired me to uh, look for a, a way that I could serve the church going forward. And I settled on the idea of being a, a missionary. So when I graduated from high school, I went to uh, uh, Georgia Tech uh, to be an engineer. Uh, with the idea that I would go into mission service as an engineer. <clears throat> and uh, while, while I was there uh, in college, I uh, decided I probably should have a theological background for, for that, uh, that work as, a, as an engineer in missions. So I, I settled on Perkins as a school that would suit my taste. And uh, uh, I went then to Perkins for a year. 
And while I was there at uh, Perkins, a gentleman from the staff of the what was then the Board of Missions, later to become the General Board of Global Ministries, came to campus to interview people uh, who were in school there that had expressed an interest in being uh, in missions. And after talking with me for about 45 minutes, he said that uh, the thing that the board would have in mind for me to do on the mission field would be to teach math and science in high school. And I thought, wow, that's really a good mission for somebody, but not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I went through some soul searching about uh, what my goals might become with that one kind of being frustrated uh, by the official uh, church and um, decided I would leave seminary at the end of that year and after consulting with my faculty advisor there mm. and uh, uh, found my own mission then uh, going around the world looking for oil and gas uh, as a geophysicist and uh, did that for 32 years uh, continuing to be uh, very active in the churches where I would uh, uh, find myself uh, and my wife uh, with me. Uh, I had one experience that uh, kind of was eye-opening for me, I thought, uh, when we were in Santa Monica, uh, first a Methodist church there, a uh, real dynamic young pastor, Paul Woodenberg, uh, asked me at one point, if I would be open to becoming a member of the, uh, what was then, I guess, the administrative board. And I told him that, gee whiz, uh, I'd really like to do that, but I just am really super busy in, in the work I'm doing, and I'm not going to have time to do that. And he said, that's all right, no pressure. Uh, and uh, I've regretted that ever since. I gave Paul the wrong answer. I, sh <laughs> I should have said yes. And uh, uh, it was a lesson to me then, and I, I've uh, uh, mostly from there, beginning from there, said yes to opportunities <laughs> to serve in the church. And uh, uh, there have been a lot of them, and I've taken advantage of many and most of them. So you, Santa Monica's in California, right? Yes. So born in Florida, then you traveled all over for work, and then uh, one of the places you lived in for a time was Santa Monica, California. You're in you're in Alaska today. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Are there any other significant places where you've plugged into the United Methodist Church? You know, uh, I think I can answer that question best by uh, speaking of the one place uh, that I ended up where that I was not. Uh, in the United Methodist Church or the, its predecessors. Uh, uh, for a year and a half, we got sent to uh, Calgary, Alberta in Canada. Mm -hmm. and, um, the Methodist Church long ago, I think it was back in 29, somewhere around back there, uh, the, the Methodist Church in Canada, which was a descendant not from the Methodist movement in America, but uh, directly from the Methodist movement in England, the mm -hmm. mother church, Mm -hmm. um, uh, it merged um, with the most of the Presbyterian churches in Canada. There were some Presbyterian churches that held out, didn't didn't join, but uh, it became then the United Church of Canada. And so there wasn't a Methodist church in Calgary, and and we were committed to becoming a, a remaining active in church. Mm -hmm. So we joined the United Church of Canada there for that year and a half. And that's the only time in my life I haven't been Methodist. That's what that if, I call, if I recall correctly, uh, there's a confession of faith from the United Church of Canada in the back of the United Methodist hymnal. Yes, there is. <laughs> okay. And I remember right. it's actually not too bad. I, I remember looking at it critically a few years ago and going, that's that's decent. Which They've got a pretty good creed. You're, you're right about that. Yeah. And of course, the United Church of Canada is a member of the World Methodist Council. So they're part of the family. That's but, good to uh, know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but everywhere we've lived, uh, we've uh, been active in uh, in churches, and and we haven't haven't found a bad one yet. <laughs> we've uh, we've just loved every every church and the friends we made in every church. And every time we left, 
uh, it was hard to leave the friends behind, of course, in, including at the United Church in Canada that we were members of Pleasant Heights mm -hmm. in Calgary. Uh, they've all been great. We, so you, we worked in Saudi Arabia for a while. Uh, and, there was no Methodist church there, but we re remained members where we left from. We were only in, in Saudi Arabia for three months, but uh, there was an active faith community there, uh, very much behind the scenes, of course. Uh, uh, one can't be uh, an open practitioner of the Christian faith in Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. but uh, it's, it's tolerated uh sort of under the radar uh, mm -hmm. that we have faith communities in the Christian life gathering in in homes and uh, small places. So you, you were a cradle roll Methodist. You stuck with the Methodist church wherever you moved, wherever you went. You got a, a wonderful wingman with you to say your wife's name? Ariana. Ariana. Is she Hispanic? Yes, she's, she was born in Mexico. We met in El Paso. Wonderful. And how long have you two been married? Wow, 66. Uh, 68. Uh, Over 60 years. Yeah, uh, getting close to, uh, to 60. And it, uh, it's, it's 60, uh, a really long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what a blessing. So she's been with you the whole time. Seven, I guess it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, do you two have any kids together, or have you just been a a, a duo? It's just a duo. Yeah, we don't have children and okay. grandchildren either. Has she had the energy for church politics that you have? Uh, actually, no. Uh, she much prefers to be uh, uh, supportive and. Uh, uh, take an active role in the local church uh, where we where we land uh, and, and the, the moves that we've made. And, and mind you, when I say the moves that we've made, uh -huh. uh, when we came to uh, Anchorage in 1974, uh, we felt like we'd finally come home. And yeah. uh, so we we've resisted uh, moves. And of course, now we're retired. So we live wherever we want to live. And Anchorage continues to be the place where that is. We, we uh -huh. want to live in Anchorage. Uh, uh, we, uh, we moved 10 times in the first seven years we were married. Oh my. And when we got to Anchorage, we said, that's it. We, we don't uh -huh. think we'll move again. Yeah. Two different times during that period of time we've been in Anchorage. Uh, um, uh, I was told that my paycheck would be in Houston. Um, and, um, uh, uh, we decided that was fine. I'd just take an apartment there and be a commuter, uh, and From uh, Anchorage. Uh, from Anchorage to Houston, yeah, that's quite a commute. But uh -huh, yeah, we, we did it. And Adriana was a school teacher most of uh, our, our lives together. Uh, she's retired now too, of course. But uh, during that period of time, the, the, over two different times, I was required to be in Houston for work. Uh, mm. We about a year and a half to two years each time, so it wasn't that long. But in any case, uh, I like to say that during that period of time, Adriana had the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, she would be in Anchorage all winter long teaching school. And then uh, it, during the summer, the three months, she'd join me in Houston. Uh -huh. Some people might say that's reverse of the ideal, but. <laughs> so, okay. So just trying to understand you and kind of what, what are, where you're coming from. I've, I've noticed there are three different motivations as to why people stay with the method you know you've stuck mm -hmm. with it from the very beginning the the three basic motivations i've seen in people is a sincere desire for holiness and a belief that um, the methodist wesleyan tradition does that better than any other um, a desire for social justice and making social stands and mobilizing putting out pronouncements and resolutions that are on the right side of history and uh, calling the the world to do better and then it's just all i've ever known and I, I, I was, I was born into this tradition, and I'm, I, I'm just going to stay with this tradition out of who I am in the world. It's my sense of identity. Do you have a sense for? I think it can be all three for some people. Usually, it's just two, or sometimes just one. What's, what's kept you on board with the Methodist cause all these eighty some years of your life? It would be almost certainly naive of me to say that number three wasn't a powerful factor, which is to say uh, genetic almost, uh, oh, certainly yeah. early training uh, um, 
has has made it uh, uh, almost impossible me, for me to think of actually moving to another faith tradition. Uh -huh. But but I've put a lot of uh, thought and intellect uh, into uh, reflection on uh, the the church and its uh, polity and its theology, uh -huh. and I am uh, really comfortable with uh, with the United Methodist Church and its uh, theology and its polity. Uh, as a general rule, that doesn't mean that I agree with every stance that the United Methodist Church takes on every issue. Sure, I've I've never seen such a person. I don't think there is one, uh, because many of our our, uh, our stances are quite contradictory. I, I remember, in particular, just to illustrate what I mean by that, Please. at one general conference, uh, we simultaneously adopted a resolution uh, calling for the United States government to reject uh, any intervention in the internal affairs of another nation. In particular, this was a reaction to the Reagan administration's uh, policy with the Contras in Nicaragua. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, and at the same general conference, we adopted resolutions calling for active uh, United States intervention in South Africa and put, to pose apartheid, uh, and um, in the, was the Middle East, uh, yeah, uh, to uh, intervene in the affairs of Israel to protect in protection of the of the uh, uh, Arab Israelis. Yeah, yeah, and and so you can't logically support both those but we did so so, so um, how no one person can uh, can logically support everything that the united methodist church does uh, me included uh, but by and large i do support the the church sure. and uh, early on in my uh, decision to be active in the connectional uh, part of the church rather than just confining my activity to the local church, uh -huh. I, I decided that it was it was my responsibility to be active in trying to correct those things that I uh, uh, thought were in error, uh -huh. and so that's been part of my my mission. And I should say that uh, overall, I could characterize my mission that I've perceived for myself anyway uh, to be the empowerment of the laity uh -huh. uh, in these processes. And, and when you talk about power in an organizational sense, essentially you're talking about the ability to make decisions for the organization. So that's that's been what I've been working for is to find uh, more ways for lay people of the church uh -huh. to be active in the decision-making processes of the church. Yeah, I've reviewed some of the legislation, not all of the legislation that, that you've proposed for the next general conference. And I do note that concern for the the laity and empowerment, uh, empowerment of the lay voice. So uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit, I think. I wanted to talk through some of the legislation you're proposing. But um, you, you already cited one um, hi historical um, marker that, that dates you, the, the Iran-Contra uh, no, that wouldn't. No, is the 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 Nicaraguan uh, affairs, which of course um, Mark Tooley talks about that as being what got him on board with critiquing the United Methodist Church because supposedly it was sending money to the National or World Council of Churches that was then funneling it to guerrillas on the ground and in, in Nicaragua. I I haven't seen that firsthand reporting, so I don't know how accurate that is. But um, of course, the United Methodist Church, deep down in its bones, was always politically active to some degree. Well, from, yeah, from the very beginning, it, it used to make, well, it's on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and it, it directly tries to impact uh, national, international policy. Um, but that, I think, the, the, the historical reference would be, what, 19, late 1970s? Is that when you got involved in the connectional structure of the denomination? If we talk about connection beginning at the annual conference level, which I think is is where we'd really have to start, 
uh, I began uh, that work in the late 70s. Okay. Uh, I actually became active in the general church in 2000. Mind you, I, re I retired from my work as a geophysicist in uh, 94. Okay. And prior to that, I was I was really way too wrapped up in in the work that I was doing in geophysics uh, to be uh, active very very much beyond the local church. Although mm -hmm. I I did uh, serve as a lay member of the annual conference, and of course that that service in itself was eye opening for me and. Uh, that's where I began to have some visibility on the possibility of being involved in the church beyond the annual conference. But I was elected to be a, a member of the delegation, the a second elected layperson to the general conference in 2000. Uh, and uh, that was my first uh, service uh, in the church beyond the annual conference. Uh, I, I was I actually also elected to be a member of the General Commission on the Christian on Christian Unity and Interreligious Concerns. Uh, and if anything, that was more engaging and opened up more of an opportunity for getting into the the process of legislating uh, for the general conference than uh, serving as a delegate was, or as a, a member of the delegation. I wasn't the delegate, but first reserve delegate. Then in uh, then in 2004, 2004, I was elected to be the, the lay delegate to General Conference. And that really was the, uh, the, uh, the beginning of uh, intensive service in the church beyond the annual conference for me. So uh, I think the the general board you just referenced is the GCCUIC was the uh, the acronym. Yes, um, and depending <laughs> the on acronym your acronym is almost as long as the name. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my polity teacher at uh, BU School of Theology was Glenn Messer, who served on that team. Do you know that name? I do. He was on the staff uh, for a while. Uh, actually, I think he came on the staff just toward the end of my service. I served for eight years, which is the limit on uh, GCCUIC, and uh, Glenn uh, was was a member of the staff later, late in that uh, time that I served there, and, and I got to know him. I stayed uh, involved with that uh, commission even after my service ended as a consultant, uh, legislative consultant for it for a while, and Glenn was in involved with it while I was doing that work. But I, I served as a member of the commission with Glenn's dad, Don Messer. He was a member of the commission at the same time I was. Oh, that's fun. He was a fantastic professor. He's the one who um, really got me passionate about Wesleyan uh, class meetings and how essential they are for the DNA yeah. of, of the Wesleyan movement. So that's something that I've carried with me throughout my uh, my ministry, even though he probably wouldn't be real comfortable with how far right I've gone. Um, I, I, I still carry very uh, fond memories of him, and, and I've admired a lot of the people who do that work at the GCC UIC because I just – uh, I don't, I wonder what those conversations must look like, but that, you know, I, I didn't want this. Maybe that's a follow-up conversation. I, so the, 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 the eagle eye view you have of the denomination goes back to the early 2000s. You've got two, two decades at least of really decent uh, perspective on the inner workings of the denomination, how everything is connected, who the personalities are. Of course, it's such a big picture, nobody could see it perfectly, but it, it does seem like you have a particularly informed perspective. Um, there are some particulars that I know you're concerned with, but before we get into, uh, yeah, I'm, the, the next thing I was gonna turn to was your op-ed that was published on February 3rd. But I just, I'm curious to know just kind of a sense to take the temperature of, of who you are. Um, there's what happened at general conference, the special called conference in 2019, and then there's what happened immediately afterwards. And um, were you in the room? Um, were you at general conference 2019? I was uh, in attendance electronically. The, the, the thing was, I was 
scheduled to go. I, I wasn't a member of our delegation uh, in uh, 2016. I was that I was not, was not a candidate. I didn't uh, thought it it was time to open it up for maybe someone younger. And ironically, the conference elected the only candidate who was older than I was uh, <laughs> served in that position. So uh, whatever. But uh, in any case, uh, in uh, March 2019, uh, well, let me back up one step from that. As I was getting ready to leave to get to go to the airport to get on the airplane to go to St. Louis for uh, just to be there because mm-hmm. uh, I hadn't missed a general conference since 2000, um, I got really sick and I I, I was um, having some real problems and. So I decided I had I just had to cancel. I couldn't get on a plane that way. And then within a, a short time, uh, my uh, uh, diagnosis came in that I had lymphoma. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so, I, no, I was not at uh, General Conference 2019 because I was really sick. But watch the whole thing on uh, on the uh, streamed service that was available. Uh, so I I felt like I was there, even though I wasn't. So I saw every minute of it. Uh, that was four years ago. What happened with the lymphoma? I've got to ask. Uh, I immediately went into uh, chemotherapy. Uh, uh-huh. and, uh, that uh, treatment was extremely successful in my case. Uh, Fantastic. And then so then in July, after uh, an, an intensive round of chemotherapy, I was found to be cancer free and uh, been monitored very closely with scans and different uh, blood tests regularly since then, and I'm still in remission. Uh, lymphoma is is a disease that you never fully uh, recover from. Uh-huh. Uh, so I'll have it with me for the rest of my life, however long or short that turns out to be. Uh, but as, as far as any technology we have available now is uh, uh, able to do so, I'm cancer free. Hey, that's great. So, well, let me bring it back to 2019 then, because uh, I would characterize 2019 as a train wreck. Um, it, uh, how about how about this? I'll characterize it how I've typically seen it, and then you can add your corrective uh, to sure. it. What I saw was the institution mobilizing to change the stance, in particular, of the sexual ethics of of the denomination, and behind the scenes, and then with what the bishops brought forward, and then how the floor was governed all of the cards being stacked in favor of not necessarily changing the position, but making room uh, for the, the position on human sexuality not to be as firm as it has been. And the will of the people was very clearly against the institution. And by the end, they had made that known. But the American um, leadership in particular was unwilling to receive that. So in the, the, the days and weeks following up from that conference, they issued public statements of non-compliance with the legislation that had been passed. And um, that that's about how I would characterize it. So does all that sound accurate to you or do you feel like um, perhaps it was not so egregiously mishandled? <laughs> egregiously mishandled is even perhaps an understatement. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, th- I think your characterization is, is spot on. The only corrective I would add uh, was that uh, it was very early on in the process uh, that it became clear that uh, the carefully orchestrated, even I'd say manipulated uh, uh, outcome, uh-huh. of, which was the adoption of the one church plan. That was the whole uh, leadership of the church had oriented itself to support, encourage, and facilitate the adoption of the one church plan that was that was uh, clear uh but uh early on the, the process was was adopted that would uh, prioritize the uh the p- proposals that were before the conference uh-huh. uh, by a vote uh, in plenary uh and with that very first vote when of course pensions became number 1 but number two of the real meat of what we had go, uh, gone there to do, mm. which was adopt one of those plans, uh, when the first priority was the traditional plan, uh, uh, the, the rest of the votes were just uh, sort of uh, a foregone conclusion, including 
the choice of who would be the chair of the one and only legislative committee, the committee of the whole with Joe Harris. Uh, uh, that was also a, a signal that for, to anybody who was paying attention, how that was gonna go uh, uh, at the end. And everything else was consistent with that uh, right on through, including uh, the very narrow vote uh, to adopt paragraph 2553 uh, to uh, uh, make room for uh, 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 disaffiliations. <laughs> Interestingly enough, that was that was uh, a thing that the traditionalists uh, were ready to put in place so that the progressives uh, who didn't agree with the maintaining uh, of the uh, restrictive uh, provisions regarding LGBTQIA plus people uh, would have a way out. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not how it turned out because of the reaction, as you pointed out, in America uh, to that decision by GC-19. So uh, there, there are particulars in that that I'm interested to discuss with you, but the larger question that I'm just really itching, yeah, as I read the things that you've written, it seems to me that you appreciate the threat of ascendant progressivism and how intolerant it is of not just traditionalism, but even centrism. Whenever I saw what happened in the aftermath of 2019, I, I looked at these conferences and leadership saying that they would not comply with the will of the body. And I just said, I got to get out of here. You know, the, there, they, there is no longer any respect for the will of the body or what we put in writing. There is only the will to power of uh, the cultural elites. And that is a dangerous place for me to be. I've got to get out. I've got to help other churches get out. This is a, a toxic place. What is it? Uh, what what I'm interested in you is 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 what you do in your head where you go. No, I'm still invested. I'm still going to be involved in empowering laity and bringing about the best thing possible in this body. So how how have you thought through that since 2019? If you're clear that that the general conference was stacked and manipulated in the way that it was, and and you're not disagreeing necessarily with any of my characterizations here. What is it that has allowed you to be more gracious and trusting in this atmosphere than in someone like me? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I have a complete and uh, consistent uh, answer for that, uh, Jeffrey. But in any case, uh, I continue to be uh, persuaded <clears throat> that ultimately uh, God is in charge mm -hmm. and will prevail. And, uh, it's it's pretty messy on the road, and uh, uh, I think we can see in the biblical record the same kind of thing going on. I mean, uh, what more uh, manipulative, conniving uh, person could God have found to work with than David? And the, I don't think you could find one, and yet. Uh, God found a way uh, to, uh, at least for almost a thousand years, uh, keep Israel in place as as God's tool for the salvation of humanity, with a leader like David mm -hmm. uh, as the as a starting point uh, in in some uh, way to think of it. Uh, and so I I I see that uh, there is that possibility. For the United Methodist Church to uh, continue to be uh, God's tool for the salvation of humanity, uh, mm. I, I, along with a whole lot of other tools. I'm not saying that the whole church uh, uh, for all time is manifested in the United Methodist Church, or uh, even um, more importantly, as uh, the, the uh, one, in, uh, one church that all churches should uh, gravitate to no there there are plenty of ways to be church and to be authentically church uh, 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 with uh, uh, holy uh, one Catholic and apostolic uh, all the four marks historically of the church uh, you don't have to be United Methodist to be a church in that sense so as I, I heard all the words you said and they all make sense to me it's 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 stuck in my craw the the thing that hurts me 
is, uh, you know, whenever you, you meet somebody who shares a similar view as you, you want to be close to them, right? I mean, it's just a natural inclination to, to be in the same camp as them. And so it's really, it's hurt me to see so many people who share my same theological disposition. Um, I, I see that you're willingly staying in the United Methodist Church, but there are many that have wanted to disaffiliate and they can't, they, they can't get their church out because of the the conference leadership that they have, or they don't have the right, the, the amount of money to pay out or anything. One of the things that I think I wonder is if a number of people have just, um, if you've seen The Princess Bride, have you seen The Princess Bride? At least twice, maybe three times now, yeah. There's a showdown between Wesley, who's masquerading as a, a pirate. No, he actually is a pirate. He faces off against a, a smart guy and ends up poisoning him with iocane powder. He puts it in both of their drinks and he says, I've just built up a tolerance to it so I could drink it. And that's kind of what I've wondered about some people in the United Methodist Church is if they've just gotten used to a steady stream of poison dripping into their system from the United Methodist Church such that they just aren't going to be poisoned and they're going to continue to try and leaven the loaf even if the loaf doesn't want to be leavened. Would I be right in, if, if I apply that metaphor to you, do you feel like I've mis, misunderstood you? No, I think that's that's a good analogy. <laughs> I would okay. identify with that, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, can, I well, can tolerate a high level of poison, yeah. <laughs> See, it's just it, it. Anytime I went, not when I, I I didn't go to General Conference 2019, but I did watch it as you did, and I felt sick to my bones. You know, and and even going to annual conference, it's felt to me as though um, we're worshiping different gods, liberals and conservatives. You know, it, it, that we're when we're talking about Jesus, it's not the same Jesus. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit, it's not the same Holy Spirit when we're talking about disciples, we're making very different kinds of disciples. And the fact that we would use the same words and enter this worshipful mentality, spiritual place, but mean contradictory things. Ah, I, it just felt, it made me feel sick. Even at annual conference, I feel like I just got to get home and take a shower and keep my church isolated from these other crazy people that have taken over the denomination. So I've really, I've wondered how it is that people sit in the middle between those things and and just do their good work in the i mean as i look at your work it's just clearly concerned with the lady and fairness and crossing t's and dotting i's but this this i will bring it to the op-ed now uh, on february 3rd the united methodist news service published an op-ed you wrote called centrist progressive coalition could soon unravel in which you argue, if I summarized it, that once the traditionalists have left, the progressives are going to eat the centrist lunch. Um, that the, there's just uh, right now they've been aligned against the traditionalists, but once the tradi traditionalists are not an entity anymore, they're not going to have peace. Rather, the centrists are going to want peace, and the progressives are just going to uh, attack them. Did I did I read that broadly in a, a correct light? Yes. Um I would uh, not have used that same image of uh, our being our meaning the centrist being devoured by the progressives. I mm -hmm. think the, uh, the the language that I used in that piece was uh, the progressives will be dominated by a sense of triumphalism mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they will uh, attempt to uh, pass the entirety of the progressive agenda. And when I think of the progressive agenda here, I'm really thinking of the agenda of the Methodist Federation for Social Action, because I, th I think of that as uh, the uh, the most powerful of the progressive uh, interest groups uh, that has uh, been promoting that agenda for a really long time. Huh. Uh, and uh, uh, they, will, they will make every effort to make the agenda of the MFSA, uh, the agenda for the whole church, and I believe that that has the potential to uh, to alienate centrists enough so that many of them will uh, will want to uh, uh, disassociate in one way or another from the progressives. Uh, yeah, it seems to me that there's not even going to be. Well, when you look at the, a, a group of progressives did split off and try and do their own thing called the Methodist Connection or something like that. Uh, yeah, what they call it. 
MX LMX in there somehow. Or yeah. yeah. And it, it that group didn't last long. Yeah, because, well, when it's one thing when you are united against a common enemy and just co-opting what they have built. It's another thing whenever you have to maintain it or build something of your own. And uh, I'm of the mind that, that far leftist progressivism eats its own and, and crashes and burns at a certain point. But uh, what's kept it going so far is people like me being the, the enemy. So once we leave, uh, who's the enemy they unite against? Um, well, uh, so I saw a, a post on your Facebook talking about how uh, communism slash socialism isn't necessarily great. Are you familiar with uh, Solzhenitsyn and Gulag Archipelago and what happened in the USSR? Yes. So my understanding is that once they they killed or uh, cast out all of the rich people, it still wasn't a communist utopia. So they they found the descendants of middle class people, the kulaks, and then they killed all them and took their wealth, and it was still miserable. Um, I I would I would think that that is a kind of a universal maxim for how far leftism operates. Um, I'm not saying they're going to kill centrists, but I am going to say, well, what you, I think, are saying here in much less dramatic fashion that once the, the primary enemy is gone, you just have to find a new enemy to, to continue to attack. Um, that progressivism is, is intrinsically built against an, an opposite enemy. Um, how, how much of that do you think is like, I'm obviously listening to right-leaning propaganda and think that neo-Marxism is is the enemy and and has taken over MFSA and all these people. How how real is that, or is that a specter that I've just I've I've made bigger than it actually should be? No, I, I don't think that is a a, a misperception. I, I believe that the now mind you, I don't think that everyone who's associated with or supports MFSA mm -hmm. is a Marxist. Right. But I believe that Marxism has a comfortable home with MFSA and that kind of progressivism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the uh, objections I have and one of the reasons I've never even considered becoming a supporter of MFSA is because of its uh, leaning toward Marxism. And, and, and it may not, uh, some of the people who support the Marxist ideal might not even uh, claim that title and uh, or even recognize for themselves that that it's Marxism, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've written about that as well. In other have you? Places. Yeah. 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 Uh, other op-eds or have you written, where have you written yeah. this stuff? I would Facebook love to read mostly. that. I, I oh, post okay. most of my uh, thing, pieces on that kind of thing on Facebook. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think what I've done is, is I've identified, I think it's 10, maybe it's up to 12 now, a number of things that I've said, these are these are the the, the goals of MFSA. Uh -huh. uh, and out of that list of 12, I, I support two of them. Okay. Uh, and only two. I'm, I'm unalterably opposed to capital punishment. And I do support full inclusion of LGBTQIA plus people in the life and ministries of the church. Uh, but all the rest of the uh, of the progressive agenda that uh, I I see in the pronouncements and the leanings and um, aspirations of MFSA, uh, mm -hmm. and I reject it all. I, I don't agree with any of it, and it yeah. mostly has to do with collectivism and um, uh, the bigger's better in terms of government. That kind of idea that comes right. forward. Yeah, well, and what you focused on in the op-ed is that progressives uh, appeal to centralization of power and coercive uh, measures once once gaining control of power. And so, so, yeah, so yeah, I, I my sensibilities are largely libertarian, and and so I'm going. You know, as I read it, I was going, "Yes, who's this Lonnie Brooks guy?" I absolutely, he sees it. Um, and of course, I think it is important for people to understand that you don't have to subscribe to to a certain label. To fit within it, there are a lot of people who are neo-Marxist, even if they don't identify that way. Even if they've never read a, a single neo-Marxist thinker, their values reflect a certain worldview that is is contained in that. So I was going to give you, um, I'm still going to give it to you. I, I was concerned you were sounding too right leaning, so we needed to give a corrective on the right. But you just said out, outright you support the full inclusion of LGBTQ persons and not just involvement in laity, but also in clergy, being married in the church. You support 
uh, you you're aligned with progressives in that sense. But oh, yeah. we we've, we've bashed the left pretty good so far. So I wanted to give you space to bash the right a little bit and say where you think the shortfalls of of right leaning renewal and reform coalition has been over this time and why it is that you haven't. Has it only been the stance on LGBTQ stuff, or have there been other issues that have kind of made you go, no, I'm not a right-leaning person. I am a centrist. Uh, from a political and social point of view, I, I think the the one point uh, where I align with progressives is the one you've identified, which was a reflection of what I'd said earlier, uh, in my support of full inclusion of LGBTQIA people. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, theologically, I also, uh, I would say, identify with uh, progressives uh, more than I do the traditionalists. Uh, and I, I, would, I would not, in any sense of the word, be a biblical literalist, mm -hmm. which is to say I, I would support a much more uh, some would call it progressive. I might call it liberal uh, uh, use of biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you put it in quadrilateral terms, mm -hmm. as one of my teachers, Albert Outler, uh, tended to do, and he was my professor of history, church history at Perkins, by the way. That's neat. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, the quadrilateral uh in my judgment, is a valuable tool uh, uh, and exactly in the way that Outler intended it to be, which he was, in fact, when I was in school and he was my teacher, he was in the process of developing that theology, uh, that teaching, the quadrilateral was what he was working on primarily at that time. Uh, and uh, I don't think he ever intended for uh, the quadrilateral quadrilateral to be conceived as a an equal sided figure four right. sides for sure but right. with scripture as by far the the more important the, the longer side of the of the quadrilateral yeah. and the base of the quadrilateral on which everything else is based but that's not to say that uh, uh reason doesn't and and experience don't have a role to play Mm -hmm. in our formation of our authority. Uh, and so much more than most traditionalists I know and, and work with and relate to, uh, I I lean fairly heavily in my understanding of the quadrilateral and its role in, in uh, authority in the church, uh, lean on experience and reason mm -hmm. uh, to, to interpret scripture and use it. Understanding that still scripture is the base, the foundation. So here's how I'm understanding you so far is you make a distinction between the words of scripture and the words that are uh, in the shared covenant of the United Methodist Church, which is the book of discipline. With the book of discipline, words clearly have meaning that that should only be interpreted a certain way and adhered to a certain way. With scripture, there, there are probably multiple le levels of meaning that are to be read in light of, of a general overall structure. So whereas um, leaders in the denomination will disregard wording in the Book of Discipline that they collectively came up with because they're on the right side of history, that's wrong because we, or not we, the United Methodist Church arrived at it in good faith with clear intentions and specific outcomes desired, whereas the scriptures, the, the delivery method and the purpose is not the same thing. So so would I be right in kind of coming to the conclusion that you just, scripture is scripture, it's used to be, it's it's not meant to be interpreted that literally, whereas the book of discipline really is. Is that where the dividing line is for you? Uh, that's getting in the right direction for sure, uh, Jeffrey. I think uh, one reason that I could uh, agree with that mm -hmm. uh, is that we don't have to go back quite so far to get to the original understanding of the discipline as we would of scripture uh, okay. and uh, uh, the the culture from which the scripture derived 
and in, in which it arose mm -hmm. is so radically different from our own that that, in my judgment, has to play a role in our interpretation of its applicability to our lives today. I understand Whereas, that. Uh, the, yeah. the, the book of discipline, I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, some of that going back maybe to 1784 and the Christmas conference, okay, but sure. not much of it. Yeah. Most of it is uh, 20th century and later. Yeah. Yeah. There's less cultural distance between us and the original exactly. authors. And yeah. okay. Well, that all makes sense to me. Um, so now what I wanted, what I wanted to do, we've already been talking for a while. I was interested in your talks on your thoughts on uh, Bishop Carcano's trial, regionalization, and the state of racial tension in the United Methodist Church. Uh, do you think that that needs to be a, a separate conversation later, or do you want to just talk about one or two of them now? It's it's your birthday. You decide how much we cover. Oh, I'm, I'm ready to go on uh, to whatever degree you are, Jeffrey. Look so. at you. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about the Bishop Carcano thing first. I saw your Facebook post. I'll, I'll I'll make an overlay of it right now so other people can can read it whenever they they look at this, but. Um, you had some good history there. People like me, I don't think I've fully appreciated what you said there, which is this is unprecedented. The, never before has a bishop been put on public trial in this way. Uh, of course, Bishop Sprague was scrutinized whenever he denied the um, the virgin birth as well as miracles. Uh, and then there was also um, in the predecessor denomination, uh, Border, Borden Parker Bound. Uh, Boston personalism, uh, not just liberal, but far left liberal. Uh, these are the two public scrutinizings of uh, leadership I'm aware of doctrinally. And both of those went in the direction of we're not going to kick him out. We're not going to do anything to it. Well, I guess Melvin Talbert would be another one uh, more recently conducting a gay uh, wedding, uh, a retired bishop conducting a gay wedding in, in a, a, an area that the bishop there had said, please don't do it. And he did it anyway. But they there came is, to a just resolution of, of all that. Was there a just resolution with Sprague as well? Uh, it may not have even, I don't remember for certain, but uh, I know there was no trial, mm -hmm. uh, which presumes that there was some kind of resolution. Uh, and whether you wouldn't call it just or not is just a matter of semantics. That's the phraseology that we use. So just resolution, regardless of how just it was. Well, I, I interviewed a guy named Robert Barnes who filed charges against um, Bishop Olivito for doctrine she preached questioning uh, Jesus' omniscience and the r right standing of the second person of the Trinity. That seems to be have been just summarily dismissed without yeah. even going through the disciplinary process. That's correct. So, so well, the car yeah, actually, let me make one corrective there. Yes, please. It's that is part of the disciplinary process because the the person and and right, wrong, or otherwise, and I think it's wrong, uh, but uh, the bishop who reviews the, the charge is empowered in the discipline to dismiss the charge if he or she thinks there's not enough evidence to support taking it further. Okay. And okay. so it's, it can be summarily dismissed, and that may or may not be the right thing to have done from mm -hmm. a, a point of view, but it's, but it's consistent with the power that's been vested in that person in our discipline. So hypothetically, uh, and I've, I've done a couple segments on um, Bishop Carcano's uh, being brought up on charges and placed on, I think it's leave. Uh, she's still getting paid, but she can't serve in any capacity. Uh, she's suspended, but not, not, uh, not relieved of her pay. Yeah, that's correct. So the bishops in charge of reviewing this could have also summarily dismissed it and put her back in right standing, but yes. they chose not to. Okay. So originally it was Bishop Olivito that was overseeing it, but I, I think um, she no longer serves in the president of the Council of Bishops of the Western Jurisdiction. I, I, I forget if it's somebody else. It's not um, Escobedo Frank. Okay, okay. Um, so that's important to know, I guess. Another Hispanic but, woman. Oh, sure, yes. I, I, I have a hard time thinking in these terms. All right, so another Hispanic woman, she has also chosen not to dismiss the charges. And in fact, the, the, the trial is going forward next week or the week after in a different jurisdiction. They're doing essentially jury selection at this point. Um, it's the 19th is, is a trial date. 
And so I've, I've, I've made a lot of calls. I've tried to figure it out. Nobody will squeal on what the charges are. It's amazing to me that they're going to do this live streamed for everybody to watch. This is indeed unprecedented. It, it seems, I mean, I love it. I'm going to watch it. I'm, I'm excited. What, how should other people feel about this? Uh, is this something that you should feel differently based on if you're left, right, or center, or is there, are there some basic ethics? I'm in favor of transparency all the time. I just think people need to be trusted to know what's going on behind the scenes. So I love it. But so from your perspective, is this a good thing? Are they doing it wrong? What, what should a smart person think about all this? I think that we've, uh, uh, we've done the right thing in requiring confidentiality in the lead up to a trial. Uh, because of the possibility of coming to some kind of a resolution. Uh, and by having maintained the confidentiality, the uh, uh, the integrity of the person who is the respondent is protected that way. Uh, that's a, completely opposed to what happens in a secular process, of course, where yeah. everything is out in the open all mm -hmm. the way. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that is a is the, I can't think of another one. I think that's the only place that I would support um, uh, other than complete openness in process. Uh, I'm uh, a very strong supporter and have been in our judicial and legislative processes uh, of the of the openness of process in United Methodist Church uh, at all levels. Uh -huh. uh, our, our discipline protects that. Actually, it, most people don't know this is the restriction, but the the only remaining part of our book of discipline that requires openness of process applies strictly in a strict sense only to our general agencies, because that's where it is. And the Judicial Council's rule that a rule that's in that section of the discipline only applies to the general agencies. So our local churches, our annual conferences, and none of our conferences are, in a uh, strict sense, bound to keep their processes open. Uh, but but I, th I think that's a mistake and that our processes should always be open, uh, with this exception for confidenti confidentiality in the, uh, the lead up to a trial in a judicial process. I think the maintain maintaining that confidentiality is valuable and is important in the protection of the respondent. Uh, so uh, I think they've done the right thing and they've done that the right thing uh, and, ha and had to resist a whole lot of pressure uh, otherwise from caucuses, from uh, uh, news folks, uh, from all, all sorts of quarters uh, to, to say more about yeah. what the charges have been. But I think they've done it right. Uh, and in fact, there was a possibility that if the, the folks involved had not been so rigorous in maintaining that confidentiality, uh -huh. uh, that the process could have been found to be flawed on appeal and uh, whatever uh, findings were reached uh, 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 set aside and dismissed. Uh, do you so think, I, as I do, that they've mishandled the case by not meeting the deadline for um, moving to trial? I don't think so, because uh, the reason uh, for the delay uh, had to do with the respondent, with Bishop Caracano, uh, having uh, uh, asked for judicial counsel review of the mm. process. That put the process on hold. And that's really been the only delay, was waiting for the judicial counsel to make a ruling. And, and in fact, of course, what the Judicial Council did was say, uh, we regret it, but we don't have jurisdiction here and we're not going to make a ruling. Okay. So I'm with you. Okay, so um, the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters, would that be considered part of the general board structure or is that outside of that, do you think? That's a gray area. Uh, they are... They're not a body that's created in that uh, general agency section of the okay. book of discipline. Uh, so uh, uh, they're not rigorously speaking uh, 
an agency of the church in the same way that the General Board of World Ministries is. But they are a commission, so uh, some of the, uh, the rules and regulations that apply to other agencies would apply to them as well. They're a creature of the General Conference. It has seemed to me that there is a culture of, of secrecy and obscuri obscurantism um, at every level of the United Methodist Church. While I was still on the inside uh, in my own annual conference, I tried to get transparent, transparent financial reporting, uh, bank state, not bank statements, but um, account statements, how much the line item budget never could. Uh, from what I can tell, that's very rare from conference to conference. Um, any conference boards that met, I could never find out when or where they were meeting. I couldn't get an invite. I couldn't get meeting minutes from those meetings. And then um, once I started looking at what happened at General Conference 2019 and why it is that the traditional plan wasn't able to get passed in its fullness, the, the answer that came back to me was the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters gutted it before it even came to the floor. And so I started asking, where can I get a hold of those minutes of deliberations? And they supposedly don't exist. Um, after they, they recently met, I asked for meeting minutes from that and they, they had nothing uh, to offer me. So it's, it's, it's felt to me like there's no interest in transparency on any level, um, but so far as um, uh, uh, General Board of Church and Society, you're saying that if I were to ask for any of their documents, that I can file something like a FOIA request and they have to, to give it. That's accurate, yes. You, you, uh, okay. uh, that would be one agency that's uh, uh, absolutely bound by the open meetings uh, rule in the Book of Discipline. Uh, it's good some to know. Of the others are, are in the gray area. The, the one that has been the most frustrating to me is the General Commission on, uh, um, excuse me, uh, the Commission on the General Conference. Uh, they regularly uh, flout the requirement for open meetings. Um, and they have no authority for doing that, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't matter. The, the primary criterion that is used as uh, the reason, it's not a justification because there isn't one, <laughs> as the reason for closing a meeting is the embarrassment factor. Uh -huh. They don't want to be embarrassed. Uh, uh, and uh, so they close the meeting uh, to keep the discussion confidential. Uh, and that is absolutely against every uh, rule that we can think of in the church. Yeah, I interviewed Joe DiPaolo because he was the whistleblower from that meeting saying that uh, they never even tried to figure out if uh, if they could have had general conference before next year, that that it was all uh, a farce. Um, yeah, and it would and be too embarrassing I... to let that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, so the, the the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters, SCCCM, it, it, my, my next topic was regionalization, and it, and it easily goes there. Um, I don't know if you heard, uh, the SCCCM just recently dismissed Simon Mafunda, who was elected by the General Conference to serve as a delegate from Zimbabwe, I believe. His bishop just called him and, and gave him no good reason, but said, you're off the team now. He was one of the only ones not willing to play ball with the rest of the team that came up with this regionalization plan in concert with the connectional table. I haven't read that uh, legislative language yet. Has I don't think it's even been presented yet, just the bullet points. Am I right to understand that? You are right. And that's, uh, that's kind of frustrating and really distressing. In fact, that that body of three bodies, actually, mm -hmm. um, that, that they have not published the legislation and we know the legislation exists because uh, the Central Conference Matters Committee uh, and the Connectional Table have both approved it, mm -hmm. supposedly. I mean, that's what their, their press release said. And you can't approve legislation you haven't seen, I don't think. Right. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> and I suppose they didn't either. But that means the legislation exists, but it's not available. You can't read it. No. So the way I saw your write up and I'll, I'll place this on an overlay as well, but the way I remember your write up stating it is it is a good thing for regionalization to happen. However, the way that they do it is just creating a whole new uh, structure in the church. They're not actually abolishing the jurisdictions within the, the American church. They're just creating a new American region that stands between the jurisdictional conference and the general conference. Do, do I have that detail right? 
Yeah, that's that's part of what my critique was. I I, I actually made two. One is I, I I don't see that we do that we need another complete another uh, another complete uh, layer of structure mm -hmm. with all the expense that that would entail. And uh, the argument could be made, I suppose, that in the beginning it's not going to uh, cost a whole lot of money. We you know we'll meet at the beginning or at the tail end of a general conference, whatever, and the same delegates would serve, uh, and that's true. But uh, the one thing we know about bureaucracy is it never tends to shrink. Right. It always grows. And so we can see that's going to become a whole new expensive layer of church, the way that's been proposed. Uh, and and the other uh, cr main critique that I've got of that is that uh, I don't know anybody in the church who believes that the reason the church is separating in the United States is because of regional differences between the church in the United States and the church in Africa or the church in Philippines or the church in Europe. It's the, the separation of the church in the United States is taking place because of differences within the church in the United States. And regionalizing of the church between America and Africa doesn't address that problem. If you well, want to do, do regionalization as a means of addressing the unity of the church, a way to keep the church together, that's not the way. We're going to have to regionalize within the United States uh, as a as an important piece of that, not as a replacement for the regionalization um, around the world, but at least a piece of the regionalization just has to be regionalization within the United States as well. So your, your wording here is reminding me of Chris Ritter's legislative plan for the 2019 conference. I think it was called the Jurisdictional Conference Plan, which um, uh, it broke down the current uh, jurisdictional conferences, and then it made three, I think, based on ideology, a, a liberal conference, a conservative conference, and a centrist conference. Is that kind of what you're talking about so far as what a region it's very is? very similar. Yeah, very okay. similar to, to Chris Ritter's idea. Uh, okay. There are some differences in the way I've, I've gone about it. Hey, by the way, this is going to general conference as a petition from, from the Alaska conference. So is that is that part of the, um, oh, heck, what is this? that You, you linked to a place, is, would it be the unity and amicable separation, Robbins and Hitson? Uh, thing is that it or is it? Uh, I think I'm in, in that piece. I did mention that um, Alaska proposal, but yes, at our at our annual conference in June uh, in Alaska, we adopted a regionalization proposal mm. that did call for uh, regionalization within the United States. Uh, actually, we call it North America because we've got some Canadian churches, so it's not fair to just call it a United States thing. Yeah, but, one of the petitions, well, it's probably not, but you, you want to include British Columbia in the Western jurisdiction. Exactly so, yes. Yeah, they should be represented. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so so the regionalization plan you're saying is nakedly, so the way that I've talked about it is, okay, so if you look at Bishop Carcano's language about Africans, she said they need to grow up um, in their theology with respect to LGBTQ uh, sexual ethics and 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 stuff. I, there's this worldview on the left that uh, when you believe in um, modernism or progressivism, that 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 the church is constantly evolving to a higher mental state, a higher spiritual state. Uh, there's a there's a, tr a trend towards liberation that we're on, and that any holdouts are really regressive, and they're not understanding the fullness of the gospel. And you paternally benevolently have to compel them to be more accepting than they want to be. So I think that they've seen, sorry, you were going to say something to that? Yeah, it's, it's as if, if you want to define paternalism, that would be it. Yeah. Yes. So, so that they've seen, so the easy talking point would be to say they're racist. Look at these black and brown people they disagree with. They're just going to remove them from the, the conversation. And I know that that's kind of disingenuous because they have those same paternal superior feelings towards their traditionalist brothers and sisters that are white on the continent of North America. They're just less tolerant of them because uh, they're closer in, in proximity to them. So that's where the animosity comes out. But 
there's there's this kind of disinterested paternal dismissive uh, stance towards Africans and Filipinos that are just not going to get with the pro, uh, program. And that's that would be what's undergirding the regionalization plan as it currently stands. Would you agree with that? I would. In fact, uh, the uh, mainstream UMC uh, newsletter they put out not very long ago mm -hmm. uh, epitomized that yeah. when they just flat out said, uh, we have to be prepared to lose the Africans and Filipinos because they don't agree with us. Basically, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and summarizing, but uh, I found that highly offensive, but characteristic of the, of the attitude there. Yeah, I think Mark Holland pinned that one. I, I read yes, it on. Uh, 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 I do a weekly live stream on Fridays where sometimes I read some of those documents, and so yeah, it's it's one of these things where it's really putting at odds values that that liberals supposedly have, which is liberation for all <laughs> oppressed people, but then when we consider third world, developing world people, part of the marginalized, marginalized groups and we're alienating them. So, you know, we, we're alienating very poor people suffering for the faith across the world for the sake of a minority culture here in America that in, in relative stance to them is quite privileged, at least in a material sense. Um, but they've, they've made their choice. Their primary loyalty is to sexual minorities in North America not to uh, third world believers that have the cross and flame in front of their church. Um, and they've explicitly said, we're prepared to dismiss them and let them go. So what's, what's there to be, I mean, so in my head, that's just clearly wrong and repugnant. And that uh, in my head, if, if the left progressive contingent in the, the United Methodist church had any integrity at all, they just would have left after general conference 2019 as it was legislated that they would do. Was that just fictitious of me to expect and be upset that it didn't happen? Or do you think that, well, I don't know. That's just such a mean line of, I, I don't know. I got to figure out how naive I am in going. I was just, I was so incensed that they stuck around and said, no, we're not going to. We have the high ground. We have the positions of power. We're not going anywhere. You can leave and we're going to gouge you on the way out if we let you go at all. It's just felt so wrong at every turn um and as i talk to you you're not making me feel like i'm any more naive at being uh affronted by this to to your mind it does uh clearly breach uh just common sense ethics and so would you the way i've had to justify this is they're just so close to the situation they don't see how wrong that they are the the presupposition is we're the good guys we're on the right side of history nothing we do can be wrong and I've just imagined them being very small-minded and self-interested and self-justifying in that way. Okay, so here's the question. Is there a more gracious interpretive, interpretation of that faction that I might have that doesn't engender such acrimony on my part? I, I think that uh, your characterization of it is, is certainly accurate, uh, but it might be only one side. Uh, and the more generous interpretation might be that, uh, in fact, they do feel like uh, that they are uh, powerfully uh, right on the uh, uh, the agenda uh, agendum that uh, is important to them, which is full inclusion, mm -hmm. to the point that that uh, that eclipses the importance of any other consideration. Mm -hmm and is in fact the pearl of great price that you you can sell the field or, or go buy the field mm -hmm. uh, just to get that piece uh, uh, taken care of and I, I think that's what's going on there uh, I, I think it's it's very wrong to have uh, taken that approach I, I think for example in in uh, Southern California where the annual conference is extracting a um, a, uh, a hefty uh, exit fee on churches that want to disaffiliate in, a, in, a, in addition to the requirements uh, that are explicit in paragraph 2553. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, there's some threat uh, in North Georgia, in fact, that that may well uh, happen with the next round of uh, disaffiliation votes in that conference as well. Uh -huh. uh, and I, th I think 
that's a, a really a big error that the church could make and may well make in, in these annual conferences. In fact, uh, I've put a petition in, a pair of petitions in uh, to the general conference that would call for uh, a, uh, a a reinstatement of 2553, which is ex, uh, expires at the end of this year. Uh -huh. uh, but my proposal would even be to reduce the uh, uh, the exit fee from two years of apportionments to just one, uh -huh. current year only, uh, and not uh, and to re uh, revoke the authority of the annual conferences to add a, add additional conditions. Uh, so that would be my proposal. Uh, it Can't is you being amicable. Good for you. That's wonderful. Which would which make it really effect? amicable. I, I, I'm, yeah. Amicable separation is what what we're, I think are, what our goal ought to be here, and that would be true amicability and separation. Yeah, it really has been. Uh, I I read an op-ed ten years ago saying we know the split is coming. We've seen how badly other denominations have done at it. We're going to do better. And then it really has been disheartening to see us not do any better. And I, I've been oh. meaning to set aside time and look for that op-ed just to put it out there and say, guys, you know, this was this was something we were all on board with. What what made you forget? But uh, I, I just love that you and others, I, I assume, I hope you're not the only one coming with amicable uh, uh, legislation for General Conference 2020 that's going to meet next year. Um, and of course, I hope to to talk about the particulars of that in, in coming episodes on my channel. I, I did want to pivot at the last bit because your historical perspective, you've actually lived through the 1960s, the late 1960s, that was so racially uh, turbulent in, in our nation. Uh, in dealing with the United Methodist Church, we've talked about the global racial uh, divide, which of course, a lot of culture maps onto that. But within the United States right now, uh, the ideology of uh, critical race theory is ascendant, which it's an it's not an exact term, but uh, I associate it with race, race essentialism, believing that people of diff different races are actually different in some essential ways, that individuals are primarily uh, members of their their racial group before they are individuals and that that we need to be maintaining these quotas and uh, that that the face of a given person and authority, their racial uh, uh, heritage matters. It's a whole family of ideas that is decidedly not classically liberal, but is, is uh, I would consider a regressive in a racialized sense. But that seems to be what uh, General Commission on uh, Cause Row, Status and Role of Women has had, as well as race and religion. And you see it. Um, on every level of church governance, annual conference and general conference level. It, meanwhile, um, yeah, Lewis Center on uh, Religion, whatever they are, they say that the the people leaving the denomination are mostly white. But when you look at when the denomination was formed, 20% of United Methodists were black. Nowadays, only 5% of United Methodists are black. They've been leaving this whole time. They're not interested in the United Methodist liberal project. Meanwhile, you know, we're, we're elevating whatever black voices we can find, not just black, but non-white people of color. And I keep saying we because <laughs> it takes me a while to detach. I'm not United Methodist. But what's to be said about the whole racial conversation in the United Methodist Church right now? It seems to me like the anxieties of the late 1960s are intentionally being flamed and that that when you look at um, Baltimore, Washington, or uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, but the same bishop, that they're intentionally flaming racial tensions and anxieties between people on the ground level. And I don't think it goes anywhere good. Do you see the same thing as I do? Does it feel like the same spirit of the 1960s or does it feel like something completely different to you? Uh, there are some differences and there are some similarities. Yeah, and the similarities, uh, uh, perhaps uh, outweigh the differences. I'm not sure, uh, mm -hmm. but in any case, uh, the uh, the primary flaw that I see in critical race theory, as I've as I've understood it to the degree I've understood it, mm -hmm. uh, and there's some question about the degree to which someone in my position 
who grew up a racist. In fact, um, I would I would characterize myself following Bruce Robbins on this as a recovering racist. It's impossible to have grown up in the time that I did in the 40s, 50s, 60s in the Deep South and not as a white person and not be a racist. Mm. That, that would not be possible. I, I didn't know anybody who wasn't a racist, uh, although it would be like fish and water. You know, you, fish doesn't know anything about water because it's all random. And I didn't know anything about racism then because it was it was everything that uh, dominated life. And uh, it was only when I became uh, a late teenager that I began my process of recovering from that. And um, I'm still on that that rocky road. Uh, uh, so I have I have that perspective, and I have to understand that as part of it. But I do see this, uh, and I think I'm right about this, as uh, as one of the flaws in what I understand to be critical race theory, uh, and that is uh, th there tends to be uh, the same mistake that was made by uh, by the Nazis in in World War II, uh, and it. Remember when uh, uh, the the butcher Heydrich was assassinated in uh, the Czech Republic? I think it was Czechoslovakia at that time. Uh, the reaction of the Nazis was to go to two villages. Lidice was one of them. I can't remember the name of the other, and they totally destroyed the village. It's yeah. Never been it was so thoroughly destroyed, everybody was killed. Mm. And it, it was a matter of assigning guilt for the associate for the assassination of Hadrick to the whole village, to mm. the different villages, because they suspected that they had uh, had uh, protected and harbored the assassins. Mm -hmm. there there is a there is a similar tendency in critical race theory to assign mass guilt for individual wrong. And yeah. that is never, ever, under any circumstances, an appropriate response to uh, to the wrong. And uh, so I, that, is a, that is a fatal flaw in the theory, as far as I'm concerned, to assign mass guilt because of individual wrong. Yeah. See, and I'm okay with that as long as we're talking about the sin of Adam, of which we're all equally guilty, and and uh, I'm I'm just fine talking about collective guilt in that sense. But I've often felt as though modern racialist um, ideology is trying to supplant uh, classical Christian doctrine with a new set of sinners, a new road to repentance and salvation. Um, and so I'm I'm regurgitating a lot of other people there. That's not my unique thought, but. Either way, you know, it, it is it is interesting to hear a man of your generation who grew up with uh, r racialized air everyone was breathing, but you married a Hispanic woman that you've been happily married to for almost 60 years. You've been in the United Methodist Church, which has at least tried to pay lip service to, to um, I mean, for a while, I feel like everybody was aiming at a colorblind destination i think that's changing right now i i don't think i don't that's think what king that, calls for right yeah but i i think that modern critical race theorists are aiming for continued segregation but kind of separate but equal time i'm not sure they even know what they're aiming at to be honest i think they just know that people like me are the enemy and they they, they want they want to hurt me so either either way i'm out of it now and i i hope they can't hurt me um but i i am continuing to care about the United Methodist Church. People ask me why it is that I continue to cover them after I've left. And, and the answer was, it, it was just too hostile for me to, to speak openly about on the inside. But I think somebody needs to talk about what's going on who is not with the program. And so I'm, I'm hopefully helpful in that way. And I think, Lonnie, you've been very gracious with me in, in, in tolerating um, me kind of pitching my worldview and how well it maps on to what's going on there. And uh, I hope it's been helpful. I, I I have no idea of knowing how many people are going to watch this, but as general conference comes closer, I do hope that um, several thousand people watch this and consider your words because your perspective is so much more 
informed in mind. You've actually been on the ground. You've actually seen how things work. Um, so, hey, here's a good way to end this. How would you encourage people to pray for the United Methodist Church in the lead up to the next general conference? I would encourage people to uh, plead for and expect uh, God's guidance. And uh, 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 the the task, of course, in actualizing that is to uh, try to uh, turn what you feel God's guidance to be into a legislative program. And that's what I try to do when when I write my petitions. I've got somewhere close to 60 of them now that'll be before the general conference. Okay, well, so um, with this, you know, we publish on a few different platforms. Uh, there's always the words that come along with it. In the show notes, you've got a Dropbox website where you've got your legislation that you're proposing. Would it would it be fit, fitting for me to have the link to your Dropbox there so people can check out the legislation you're proposing? Sure, that'd be fine. Okay, well, Probably viewers, I, I've no doubt all my viewers made it to the end of this this conversation, so they can they can check those out. And if you haven't looked at legislation before, a lot of these are just two pages long. Um, some of them are more lengthy than that, but um, very interesting stuff. If if people are still in the United Methodist Church, I want to urge you. Uh, do what you can to be an informed person, know who it is going to be representing you on the floor of general conference. Let them know how you feel about uh, the different things being presented, in particular about regionalization, because it does seem like that is the main thing that uh, they're trying to shove down everybody's throats, and it, it does not necessarily reflect the will of the body. So that will be determined next year. I don't have a vote. Um, Lonnie, is there anything else important that you think uh, anyone who spent the time with us should hear or know before they uh, conclude their time with us. I think it's all there, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you. Yeah, we had a good time. We uh, we're gonna we're gonna cut the feed now, and we're gonna stay on uh, me and Lonnie and pray just a little bit because uh, uh, this is a time for fitting prayer. So, uh, viewers, I'm gonna ask you whenever uh, you turn this off, go ahead and say a prayer for the United Methodist Church, whether or not you're you're in there or not. Still, and then um, if you think that this was a helpful conversation to have and you think other people would benefit from listening to it, go ahead and share it, like it, put it on whatever platforms you're on. Uh, appreciate all the engagement people give to this. And uh, I don't know what God's going to do with it, but may he be glorified. And, and insofar as it's useful, may the United Methodist Church be sanctified. All right. Thanks, friends. See you later.